Well, good morning, everybody. What a beautiful morning compared to the last, I don't know how many days. All right, John the Baptist. Jan brought him up, so I guess we'll talk about John the Baptist today. So the people of God have had no, they've had no communication with God for 400 years. They have not had a prophet. They've had no prophecy for many generations, but the families faithful, faithfully taught the next coming generation that the Messiah is going to be coming, and there's going to be a guy that comes before him to announce his ways. So John, and you can picture John, he's living out in the desert. He wears camel skin clothes, and he eats honey and grasshoppers. He's not what people would expect to be in a leader. So when they hear John, they say, wait, you're the man. And he goes, no, no, I'm not the man. And they say, well, are you Elijah? And he, said, he said, no, I'm not Elijah. He said, well, are you the prophet? He said, well, I'm not the prophet. And so they say, if you're not the Christ, and you're not Elijah, and you aren't the prophet, then who are you? And John says, I have come to bear witness about the light. And he quotes prophet Isaiah chapter 40. I am the voice of one crying out in the witness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Preparing the way. They've been taught that the Messiah was going to come. John's claiming, I have been called to prepare the way for the Messiah. Two chapters later in Isaiah, God says this about the Christ. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. If we jump ahead to John 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And we have this dark light motif. We like to be in the light. Unless we're doing something kind of crooked, then we don't want to be in the light. We want to be in the darkness. You're, you're looking at me like none of you do that. <laughs> <laughs> when we've done something that we're not proud of, that we're kind of ashamed of, we do not want the light poured on it. We want to bury it around. Put it in the closet, shut the door, pretend it never happened. Jesus has been called into the world to be the light of the world. So back in the time of John the Baptist, the Pharisees did not understand what this meant. They didn't submit to John's baptism. They refused to repent when he told them to do so. The Pharisees were thinking, you can picture the Pharisees, their clothes are probably pressed and no wrinkles, tassels from each of their corners, you know, big things tapped on their head and their arms and showing their piety all the time. They're saying there is no way that this desert-dwelling, bug-eating guy is a prophet. There's no way we're going to submit to, to his repentance. They expected Elijah, and they said there's no way he's coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. They expected Elijah to come back and pat them on the back and, said, and say, Pharisees, you guys are awesome. You do such a good job with your religious piety and all your works that you do for everyone to notice that you're doing these works. Wow, keep up a good job, Pharisees. You're doing great. But God sent John the Baptist in the spirit and the power of Elijah to call the people to repentance in preparation for the Christ to arrive. So when John tells the Pharisees, repent for the kingdom of God is near, the Pharisees say, well, we don't like that guy, therefore he's not a real prophet. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And it's easy for us to look back in the Bible and see how clueless some of the people were, to see how clueless some of the Pharisees were. They, 
they misunderstood all the preaching in John. They misunderstood what John's talking about. They misunderstood a lot of stuff. Think about how this might apply to us today. If we misunderstand the word of the God, word of God because we're so we're so hooked into our own religious piety. In church, we want people, at least a pastor wants people, to get the sermon clearly. I want you to receive the sermon clearly, not some vague notion of what's going on. And the Lutheran church, every sermon basically comes down to this. It's the proper distinction between law and gospel. Law, that's the stuff God tells us to do. Gospel, that's the stuff God does for us. The law, you think of the Ten Commandments. Those are things we are supposed to do. Don't kill people. All right, it's a good one. Don't covet other people's stuff. All right, that's a good one. And then we have God's gospel. Jesus came to save us. Jesus did all the work for it. So in Academy, we had to read this, the proper distinction between law and gospel by C.F.W. Walther. He was the first president of the LCMS church. And I have to confess that I have never been so bored reading a book. <laughs> this book was tedious. In fact, there were many, many nights where I fell asleep in bed, and Gracie's like, I don't know, six years old, She'd come by and take my glasses off and take the book and set it down every night. <laughs> Maybe this is the truest way to determine who gets to be a pastor, if they can finish this book. <laughs> if they can do that, they can do anything. So the, the preaching of the law, it always includes a call to repentance. At the beginning of every service, we say the same thing. Lord, we messed up. According to your law, we did not follow what you told us to do. When the gospel is preached, Christ comes to you through his word and offers you absolution, complete forgiveness for your sin. He opens the doors of his kingdom for you and offers eternal salvation. Some people do not want to hear the law. Some people only want to hear the gospel, only the good stuff, that, you know, that thunderstorm stuff, the damnation, all that stuff. You know, I don't want to hear any of that, that negative stuff. Only want to hear about sunny days like today with rainbows and it's not raining any longer. This is exactly why C.F.W. Walther wrote this I was going to put an adjective in there, but I decided, no, it's probably a negative adjective. But this is why he wrote the book, because if we don't have the proper distinction between law and gospel, we don't have, we don't have the word. We don't have the full Bible. Repent, for Jesus is near with his kingdom. If we are offended by the law, then we will ignore the gospel, because... It has no meaning. Why do we need the gospel if we don't hear the law, that we're sinners? If we're offended by the law, we will miss Jesus in his word because it won't have any, it won't be applicable to our lives. If we're offended by the word, we will also miss his second coming too because the law was given to us as a blessing as a curb and as a mirror and a ruler, if you remember that from any of your confirmation classes. The purpose of the law is to keep us back on track, to keep us from messing, messing up too bad, because each one of us has this pharisaical DNA in us, in our heart, because we don't want to be accused by the law. It's uncomfortable. That's something I want to put in the closet and not let God see all my screw-ups. Because when the, the light of Christ shines on my life, it illuminates not just the rainbows and you know good times, it illuminates the times when I've failed God. 
our Pharisee DNA would rather have God pat us on the back and say, you guys are doing just great. Keep up with the, with the empty piety. Keep up and pretending you know, everything is perfect and lovely. And Better yet, accuse someone else. Like, did you know my neighbor did this? Dan, I'm not going to talk about you this sermon. Future sermon, it's coming up, buddy. <laughs> right? God accused someone else. They're, they're doing the wrong things. Accuse somebody else. We think they need to be accused when it's we, because we miss the mark when it comes to God's law. We're like a, and I wanted to share that I've been trying to shorten my sermons because I know I don't want to go over because I want us to have fellowship time in between the services. So I found this ingenious way to shorten my ser- sermons. I just changed the border size. <laughs> Maybe the font a little bit. Yeah. So instead of eight pages, it's like six. You're welcome. <laughs> Every Sunday we approach the Lord the same way. In 9 o'clock service and 1110 service, God, it's us again. It's your people from St. Mark. We messed up. We did the things that you didn't want us to do, and we didn't do the things you wanted us to do. Lord, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, please forgive us. And then Christ's words provide absolution, forgiveness for our sins. The less that we think we sin the more sin has numbed us thinking we don't need forgiveness. If you're not aware of your sin, then what does Jesus have to do with anything? This was in my my early life as a Christian, 23, 24, 25 years old. I would follow God passionately, and then life would be going great, so I'd stop following him until some cataclysm happened, then I'd get back into God, God, I'm your man, and then things went great. If I would have remembered my sin daily, like I do now, that probably wouldn't have happened because I would have remembered how much I need Jesus, how much I need God's help. This is what John the Baptist is doing. He says... I'm pointing to the one that's coming after me. I'm not even worthy of taking his dusty shoes off his feet. You want to look at that guy. John describes himself merely as a voice crying out in the desert and that he had to share this message. And his whole purpose was not to get any attention on himself, but to point it to Jesus. He pointed at the Lord who was coming The Lord who was closer than anybody thought he was coming. I think about that with the second coming of Christ when he comes back in all of his glory. Be ready. It may happen in 10 seconds from now. It may be 10 years, maybe 1,000 years. I don't know how long. We're not supposed to know how long. In fact, there's no way we can. Jesus doesn't even know how long it's going to be. He'll just follow the Father when Father, when God the Father sends him. Pay attention to the one who is coming after me. And this, this should be the true witness of all of us. When people compliment us on getting our lives back together, we can say, you know what? It was all Jesus. He's the one you should be looking at. Because I couldn't have done this without Jesus. In church, we say, this is a blessing. We can say, there he is. Jesus is in the word. He is in the Holy Communion. He's in baptism. He's in your baptism. We say, that's him. Where we receive his righteousness. Jan talked about this, about the baptism with the kids. We are washed clean. We are forgiven. Through Jesus, all creation was made. And Jesus is holy. 
we, as a people on earth, are unholy unless we have Christ's righteousness. Christ is all-powerful. We are powerless. And when we remain in our, un, our sinfulness and our uncleanliness, Isaiah 64 says, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Compared to the holiness of God, even the best deed that I can do is a filthy rag compared to God. Christ knows all things. We, because of sin, are blinded. Christ is immortal. No one could have taken his life unless he chose to lay it down. And he did, he did lay it down. He laid it down for you. In theology, we call this the great exchange. We give God everything that's wrong with us. All of our sin, our brokenness, our shame, our pain, everything. And in exchange, we get the love, mercy, hope, salvation from Christ. We get everlasting salvation. We give, what a deal. Isn't that awesome? I give God everything that's wrong with me, and he gives me everything that is right about him. So to sum up the whole story, Jesus, God with us, came down to heaven on Christmas, that very first Christmas. I love the Christmas season. He came out of perfect, sinless, holy heaven where there is no sin. He came there, he came into our world, and he chose to live in our broken world. I can't imagine that. He came and chose to live in our broken world knowing that everybody here is going to sin and everybody here is going to make mistakes. And then he personally gathered 12 disciples that he was going to teach. And guess what? They continued to sin and they continued to make mistakes. So Jesus' message for them, the message for us, is he was there to help them, to help turn them around, to help turn them the right way to help them repent what we do and turn back to God. In other words, Jesus knew exactly what he was coming into. He knew the kind of people we were, and he did it anyways. Because that's how much he loves us. And he knew there would be tons of disappointment. And I'm, I'm caught between feeling extremely sad because Jesus had to come into the world because of our sin, because of my sin. And I'm also extremely happy because Jesus came and took all my sin and gave me the secure path from heaven And then I'm feeling extremely joyful because Christ did this all for me. He did all of this for you. To fully appreciate what Jesus did and to tie it into the kids' message, which is a great choice of doing that one. That's perfect. Martin Luther, when he retired to bed, he would put a glass of water on his nightstand. So when he woke up in the morning, he would see this glass of water and remember his own baptism. Every day. When he saw that glass of water, to remember his baptism, he remembered the law and the gospel. He remembered that he's a repentant sinner that had to be saved and had to be baptized. And he's remembered that Christ is with us who forgave him all of his sins. So do whatever it takes to remember your baptism. Get a tattoo of it. If you're not going to get a tattoo, take a Sharpie. If you don't want to do those, put post-it notes everywhere. Do whatever it takes to remember your baptism every day. 
Do whatever it takes to remember the law. Even though the law, we want to initially turn away from it and hide from it, remember the law because that is why Jesus came in the first place. I'm going to close by reading Romans 6, 3, 3 to 8. This time I'm going to read it in the easy to read version. Did you forget that all of us became part of Christ Jesus when we were baptized? In our baptism, we shared in his death. So when we, are ba- when we were baptized, we were buried with Christ and took part in his death. And just as Christ was raised from the grave by the powerful by the wonderful power of the Father, so we can now live a new life. Christ died, and we have been joined with him by dying too. So we will also be joined with him by rising from death as he did. We know that our old life was put to death on the cross with Christ. This happened so that our sinful selves would have no power over us then we would not be slaves to sin. Anyone who has died is made free from sin's control. So if we died with Christ, we know that we also live with him. We have died with Christ. These words were spoken at your baptism. We will also have a resurrection like his. We have everlasting life which means we don't have to wait until the moment we die to have everlasting life. We have it right now. Death is purely a doorway that we'll walk through. Jesus has conquered death. Through our baptism, through our faith, we are dead to sin and alive to God. Amen.